Ladies and gentlemen, everywhere, It's a God Thing radio program is on the air. Yes, our God is a mountain mover, and you know what? He's still moving mountains every day. And the good news is he can move your mountains too. Hi there, this is Chuck Cooper, host of It's a God Thing radio program. Thank you for joining us today. We sure are glad you're here. You're about to listen to some awesome interviews with believers in Jesus Christ who will tell you how God has revealed and proved himself to them by moving mountains they were unable to move by themselves. They say that their stories can only be described as a God thing. Ready for a real blessing? Alrighty then, let's do this God thing. Well, thanks for joining us today. We have two very special God thing stories for you that we believe will surely light your fire. Both are from longtime friends and encouraging supporters of our radio ministry. First up is the story of Pete and Carol Coots of Franklin, Tennessee. About five years ago, Pete was diagnosed with cancer, but today, by God's healing power, He is totally cancer-free. His compelling story will absolutely amaze you. Our second story is how God miraculously orchestrated a divine appointment so that my former college classmate and business partner, Hope Hines of Brentwood, Tennessee, and I could be used to save a friend's life. We pray that these stories of how God works in the lives of his believers will both encourage and inspire you. Now, here are Pete and Carol. Well, Chuck, my story goes back to the fall of 2013. I uh, had developed a cough, and it didn't bother me a whole lot, but it bothered Carol. As wives do, she said, we got to go see a doctor about that. It was primarily in the mornings. So after a while, I agreed to it. We went to a pulmonary physician and uh, had a breathing test with him. He didn't care for the results, and he said he wanted to do another test. This was a very invasive test where it put you to sleep and they ran tubes down my nose into my lungs. And one of the tubes was a camera. The other was some sort of a surgical instrument to take a biopsy. And I did that. hated every minute of it. And he came back and he said, I'm certain this is malignant. You, you've got a tumor. Oh my. And the tumor is in your airway as it enters the, the lung, the left lung. And it was a tumor about the size of a golf ball. Let me ask a question, Pete. <laughs> what was your reaction when you heard this? I mean, every, nobody wants to hear the C word. No. Uh, this is hard for me to explain, Chuck. Throughout this whole thing, I really didn't have any feeling. No feelings? Uh, no I had I had no, no fear of what it might have been. I was just calm throughout the whole thing from the very beginning. I mean, I, I didn't care for the test because it was very invasive. But afterwards, when he said, I'm, I'm sure it's cancer, I, I just, I had no reaction to it. Well, Carol, what about you? What was your reaction? I cried. <laughs> it was scary, very scary. <clears throat> And I cried a lot, but he was strong through the whole thing. Very, very strong. I just, I never had an emotional moment with him. That's amazing. So he said that he felt sure it was cancerous and sent a biopsy off. Came back malignant and uh, no one was surprised by that. And he said, I'd I'd like you to see a a surgeon Mm -hmm. and I'll recommend to you. So he recommended this surgeon. We went to him. And I was not feeling bad about it because the surgeon, his father is a friend, a retired physician that I play golf with. (laughs) And I thought, well, if the kid's anything like his daddy, he's going to be a nice guy. Well, he wasn't. He wasn't anything like his father. We we were sitting in the examining room, and he came in, and uh, he sat on a stool with wheels, wheeled the stool over in front of us, 
very cold, distant, pragmatic, no bedside manner at all, not anything comforting. Actually, I thought he was a rude individual. And uh, he looked at me and told me that uh, I had this, this cancer, and it was inoperable. 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 But what he wanted to do was to take another biopsy to validate the first one and see just how extensive this was. So he proceeded to explain to us that he was going to do this surgery and he was going to enter through my throat. And he was going to go down through through my throat to that golf ball sized tumor. And he said, there's, there's some serious risk with this. He said, I've got to get in your vocal cords. And he said, if anything happens there, it would cost you your ability to, to speak. He said, in the way the tumor is located, he said, there's a danger that I could nick the aorta. Good gracious. And if if that would happen, uh, you'd bleed to death. You weren't feeling very comfortable about all this at that point, were you, Pete? Well, you know, I was probably more upset with him and his attitude than anything else. You know, sometimes you meet somebody and pretty much don't like them from the get-go. Right. Yeah, well, that was that was my experience with him. So, so did he do the <coughs> procedure? Did you allow him to do the procedure? No, he went through all of that and explained everything, and I, we might have been a little numb at that point in time. I, I was upset with the guy. I, yeah. mean, I, I was upset with the guy. How did you feel about him, <clears throat> Carol? I didn't like him at all. I cried through the whole thing. I mean, he was just, it was just, just the way he described it. I mean, it was horrible. And he said, Pete, your prognosis is not good. He looked Pete right in the face. He said, your prognosis is not so good. So not encouraging in not at any all. regard. Yeah. Not at all. Not in it, not in any regard whatsoever. But we let him go ahead and schedule it. He scheduled it before we left the office. Well, you know, I think he did it, and I wasn't realizing exactly no, we, what he did. We weren't. <laughs> but he scheduled an operation. Okay. So we leave, and they give us a piece of paper with a date on when I was going to have this wonderful operation, and that was our wedding anniversary. Oh day. my! Yeah, that, that day we were there to see him. <laughs> it was the wedding anniversary. And we were going to go into Nashville to a nice restaurant and have dinner. And we did that. And it wasn't the happiest of occasions, uh, certainly not. But that night, well, we, I guess, decided at the restaurant we're not having... No, when we, we got in the car, we decided. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we just weren't going to have that. So we have dinner. We come home that evening. And we were sleeping in different bedrooms. Snoring issues in the house, right? <laughs> We were going to a Tennessee football game the next day, early game. We had to get up at 4 in the morning. So I got up at 4 in the morning. About 4.30 that morning, she came walking in the bathroom where I was. It's all yours. Well, I cried all night. When we got in the car after we were in the office, we both got in the car and looked at each other, and I said, I don't like that man. And he said, I don't either. And I said, we're not going to do this. I said, not the way he described it. I mean, it was just... I just can't describe how he told us what it was going to be involved. I mean, it was terrible. So I cried <clears throat> almost all that night just thinking about what he had told us. Sure. And about 4.30, I was laying there. And when I tell people this story that aren't believers, you know, they're like, yeah, right, Carol. But God spoke so clearly to me and said, girlfriend, he said, we're not going to go that route. He said, I want you to have a piece about this. And it's all going to be okay. Wow, Carol, did he and did he speak audibly or audibly? It was like he was right beside my bed. Oh, and amazing! I jumped out of bed and I ran into the bathroom. He was shaving, and I, I was smiling. And he said, "Why are you smiling at four thirty in the morning?" I said, "God just called me girlfriend." And he said, "Well, he never called me that." And I said, "Well, I'm glad." Yeah, that's true. <laughs> And that was it. We just decided that, you know, we weren't going that route. And God said it was going to be okay. Well, Pete, how did you respond to her when she said she had heard God <laughs> talk to her? I believed her. It yeah, was real. I, it was so real. I had no, uh, you had to see the look in her, her <laughs> expression, the look in her eye. And uh, you'd have believed her if you'd have yeah. heard it. You would have seen it. I believe her now. And uh, <laughs> so we got up. We went to the football game. 
did we win? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I can't even tell you who we played. <laughs> I can't either. And uh, when we got home, we called the doctor, the pulmonary doctor, and we told him the miserable experience we had with this surgeon. And he was surprised. <clears throat> he was very surprised, wasn't he? was wasn't very he? surprised. Surprised that he, you know, was that type of person. He said, sure. oh, that's not what, you know, I thought and he was. This this is a thoracic surgeon that has a big-time reputation. I mean, he's the head of the thoracic surgery department at a major teaching university. Uh, the doctor was surprised, but uh, we, we weren't impressed at all. So we told him that the surgery was uh, not going to happen. He then lined us up to see an oncologist. We went to the oncologist. Then I had a, that's when I had a PET scan, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Had the first PET scan. And uh, he confirmed the cancer, and he staged it at 3A, which uh, wasn't good. And his recommendation was that we do chemo and radiation treatments simultaneously, beginning immediately. Again, I was just, I had a piece about me that it's hard for me to explain. It is just, it's hard to explain. We said, all right. So I did 12 chemo treatments, 30 radiation treatments. That was all over a period of about three months. I had no issues. Went to work every day. I only missed two days of work in that whole thing. My goodness. And when it was over, I had another, another scan. And uh, he walked in the room where we were, and he said, you're cancer-free. I, I see no cancer on your, on your scans. And this was after about three months of treatment? Mm-hmm. Now, Chuck, we had, there were people praying for me literally around the world. I was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you for that. <laughs> there were people that were even praying that I wouldn't lose my hair. That worried him more than anything, <laughs> that he'd lose his hair and his eyebrows and his eyelashes and his beard and his mustache. <laughs> so he'd, he'd be a younger Telly Swallows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we went through all of that. Did you lose your hair? I did not lose hair one. Good. Yeah. And did have a couple bad weeks with the radiation where it was bur had burned my esophagus mm -hmm. uh, pretty severely. I couldn't eat, lost some weight, but that was it. He'd when? say, I am so hungry. <clears throat> I'm so hungry for such and such. So I'd make it and I'd put it down in front of him. He'd say, oh I, I can't. I just can't eat it. And he really did lose quite a bit of weight during that time because it was so sore. His whole esophagus was burned bare. He wasn't burned on the outside, but it was all inside. All right. And he right. still to this day has a lot of scar tissue that they tell him is going to be there for the rest of his life. But So... How long ago was that, Pete? That was November of 2013. I've been getting scans every six months and totally cancer-free. have a, another scan coming up in about a month, and uh, that will be totally cancer-free. And the Lord, for whatever reason, just decided he was going to heal me, and that's what he did. Do you know the reason? Well, I've got to tell this story to a whole lot of people since then. He's given me a testimony that I absolutely would have never had before. Sure. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe there's something else down the road. But whatever it is, I'm open to it. And you'll never convince me that he did not just miraculously heal me. No way I can be convinced otherwise. Sure. It's just it's just the way it happened. God knew I wasn't ready to give him <clears throat> up. <laughs> God knew that? Yep. Well, he spoke to you about yeah, it. I did. guess he did. <laughs> yeah. So, Chuck, after that whole deal with the cancer treatments was over, I was reading the Bible one night, and I came to Mark chapter 6, verse 53. And it's the story of Jesus and his disciples having beached their boat on the shores of Gennesaret. And people were just lined up everywhere waiting for him to come off the boat. And they did. People totally surrounded them. They brought all of their sick, all of their ill people because they knew Jesus could heal them. They'd heard of Jesus. They'd, they'd seen uh, what he had done in other areas. They literally mobbed him. Everywhere he went into the remote areas of Gennesaret, they followed him, carrying the infirmed. And it ends in verse 53 by saying, 
that all they wanted to do was touch the tassel on Jesus' robe and they knew they'd be healed. And the last verse says that, and everyone who touched the tassel on his robe was healed. And I thought, that's pretty heavy. Wow. So I made it a point to get a tassel. And I have carried that tassel in my pocket 24-7. If I'm in bed, there's my tassel. If I'm up playing golf, there's, there's my tassel. And I've had the opportunity, when I tell that story, to give people a tassel and give them hope. Man, oh man. That's so a, I have gone through a lot of tassels. I bet you have. And I've talked to a lot of people. But uh, it's a testimony to the fact that we serve a healing God. There's nothing He can't do. There is no disease there is no stage of any disease that means anything to him. Not at all. I don't care how sick you are, how infirmed you are. He can heal you if it be his will. In my case, it was his will. That tassel is my testimony to the fact that I serve a healing God. That's an amazing, <laughs> an amazing story. Going forward, uh, it's going to be the same thing. We'll go in for a scan in a month. We'll sit there. I'll go in in the morning and uh, uh, have a scan, get blood work done, go back a couple, three hours later uh, for a visit with the doctor. We'll be sitting in a room. He'll come walking in with a big smile on his face. That's what Carol looks for. Yes. That's he said, tipper. if I walk in without a smile, you know, it's not good news. Right. And I said, well, you better walk in with a smile every time. And, and so he he'll, does, he'll he come did. walking in, he'll have a big smile on his face, and we'll say, thank you, Jesus, and <laughs> see you in six months. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program for an important update. Just last week, Carol got a huge smile from Pete's doctor. The scan was clear, blood work was excellent, and no further treatment for Pete. His follow-up scan is scheduled in six months. Praise the Lord. Now, let's get back to Pete's story. Pete, that's an amazing story. And I think you're right. I think he has given you a personal ministry with your testimony. Because you can be of comfort to people that are facing the same challenges that mm -hmm. you had to face. I have one final question for both of you. Would you say that God <coughs> orchestrated all this? that he did miraculously uh, heal you from cancer, <clears throat> that he gave you a personal ministry, and that you would call that a God thing? Absolutely. Chucky does everything for a reason. And, uh, yeah, it's a God thing. And he gave up smoking. That could be a God thing, too, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, I smoke cigars on the golf course. I don't miss it now. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I have friends. Tell them what that, the friends said to you. When I've had friends that, say, should I not smoke in front of you? Or <laughs> do you mind if I, if I smoke? And I love the smell of cigar smoke. And I always tell them, you go ahead and smoke, just blow it my way. <laughs> <laughs> and they do, and they we, do, yeah. we're doing fine. We're good. Chuck, it's given me the ability to talk to people with cancer, to understand them, and... Uh, we do visitation for, for our church, and uh, if there's anybody in the cancer category, uh, I always go to them. Sure. Because I can relate to them now. Sure. Sure. And they can relate to you. Yeah. But it is, it was, it shall be a God thing. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you two uh, sharing this story, and I believe you're going to be an inspiration to people that happen to hear it. Thank you so much, well, and uh, we'll be praying for another good scan. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a great story. It's our hope that you have been inspired, encouraged, awed, and intrigued by what you heard today. We earnestly pray that hearing these stories as a regular listener to our program will be a source of hope and encouragement to you, that these stories will strengthen your faith in God and will lead you to a closer walk with Jesus. Whether you are a believer in Jesus Christ or a not yet believer, we pray that you will reflect on the God thing incidents in your own life and conclude that it was God at work and that he was knocking on your door. Now, let's get back to today's program. Well, we're pleased to have with us today Hope Hines from Nashville, Tennessee. 
hoping I go back to college years. And uh, we had a tremendous God thing story happen to us several years ago. So, Hope, why don't you share what, what happened? Chuck, first of all, it was good to see you and Sue. We don't see enough of each other anymore. And uh, just thank you that uh, you're doing what you're doing to bring uh, the Word of God and the stories that, of God and the way He affects people's lives so that other people can benefit and share and be blessed. Sure. You and I, yes, we do. We go way back to the University of Georgia. After that, uh, I'm working in Nashville, Tennessee in television, and uh, you and I formed several companies. Right. We had two companies at one time, and uh, we had a truck sign company, and we had a production company. Right. On this particular day, you and I had been up to a place north of town called Smiley Hollow. And Smiley Hollow was a retreat, a business retreat, where people would go, corporations would take their employees out for training, physical and mental. And so it was, uh, it had a barn, and they did uh, theater and music and dances and that sort of thing. So in our production company, we did uh, production for businesses who wanted to showcase to their customers in those days on videotape. <laughs> videotape. And so we uh, we produced these 10, 12, and 15 minute marketing tapes, we call them. So that's the reason we were at Smiley Hollow and we left. So we're coming back from Smiley Hollow and I'm looking to get up on the expressway and I miss the turnoff because we're talking or engaged in conversation. So I miss the turnoff and I said, Dad, damn it. And then the thought came to me and said, oh, it's okay. Let's go by and see John. He owns an advertising agency there in town, and I used to work with him, knew him for a lot of years, and so it was okay that we missed, or it was okay with me, sure. that we missed the expressway and the turnoff. And you agreed. You said, yeah, let's go by and see John. You knew him too. So we turned into the parking lot uh, where his office was, and oddly enough, the first clue there was not many cars in the parking lot, and he had a, a very busy office most of the time. Right. We walk in, and there's no receptionist, which there usually is, and so... Uh, knowing John the way I did, I just walked on back to where his office was, and the door was closed, and I knocked, and there were no other people in the in right. the building or in the office anywhere to be seen. So I knocked on the door, and a faint sound come in, very down, dejected type response. And so we opened the door and walked in. Of course, I'm happy, and you're happy, and <laughs> our my friend, our friend is not happy. And I look at him and I say, John, what's what's going on, man? I haven't seen you in forever. How you doing? Oh, so, 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 we started talking. I said, hey, look, it's, it's uh, about noon. Let's go have lunch. Oh, and he started him. I said, get up. Let's go have lunch. We haven't talked. Let's go. He said, okay. So we go to Shoney's, right. which happens to be right there, Riverdale right. Shopping Center. So we go in, and we sit down, and I'm talking, and we're talking to John, and he's sad. His heart is heavy. We can tell that. So I just said to him, John, what, uh, you're burdened. What's wrong? Took a deep breath. And he says, you know, he says, I'm, I'm about to lose my business. I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy. He said, you know how it goes. You know, people don't pay you. You can't pay other people. He said, I'm, I'm at the end. I don't know what to do. So we said, why don't we just pray about it? So right there in Shoney's, people all around us, waiters coming back and forth, we just bowed our heads and we prayed. We asked God to take this burden from John. And we prayed for, you know, a couple minutes. And when the prayer was over, I looked over at John, and he didn't have that sour, sad look That's on his right. face. He wasn't ecstatic. He wasn't necessarily smiling, but he seemed relieved. And so we finish our meal. We take back to the office. You and I go back to town. You go your way. I'm there at the TV station that night to do the news. And about 8 o'clock, the phone rings. I pick it up. Hope. Oh, this is John. Hey, John, how are you? I said, uh, he said, Hope, he said, there's something that I need to tell you before you go to bed tonight. I said, great, what is it, John? He says, when you came into my office today, I said, I was sitting behind the desk, and when you walked in, what you didn't see was that I had the desk drawer pulled out, and I had a handgun sitting there. He said, I was about to blow my brains out. And I didn't know what to say to John <laughs> at that point. Who would know what to say? except, thank God, you didn't. And he said, yes, he said, but it was what you all did. And so when I tell this story, here's, here's the realization. From eternity past, I was supposed to miss that turnoff. No question about it. No doubt. That turnoff was pre-planned, predestined. <laughs> and so we give God the glory 
give God all the credit. And I know, and I know you know, that when I speak, I tell that story, you have told that story. And when I speak, it sometimes tears comes to people's eyes and they come up to me afterwards and say, what an incredible story. I said, yeah, it's not so incredible about the story, it's incredible the way God handled it and dealt with it. And he does that with each and every one of us, not necessarily in that dramatic way, but in all of our lives to some point. Absolutely. And so that's just a, a, it's a precious, precious story. I know it is to you and I thank God for it. And uh, I just love telling people about it because it touches them where a lot of people really need to be touched. And that's the power of prayer. Absolute power of prayer and belief. Sure. Because he was a believer. Right. You were a believer, I'm a believer. Here are three people where two or more gather. We're sitting here in a public restaurant and we just say, you know what, we can't wait on this. We got to pray. This man is in dire need right now. And so we prayed and God heard our prayer. Actually, no, he heard it before, way before then. Right. He already had it orchestrated. He sure did. So uh, that's my story, Chuck, and I'm sticking to it. Well, <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> you know, one of the things, Hope, uh, is I I think about this, and I think about him often. Uh, I wonder too. what he's what he's what he's up to now. It's been several years ago, but one of the things that dawned on me uh, <clears throat> after you called me that night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't wait. I had to call you and well, tell you, I know Chuck. It. Here's here's what really happened today. Exactly. We well, now we know the rest of the story. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, when I answered the phone, you could hardly talk because you were crying. Oh, I, it was affecting me in a powerful, I very meaningful it did. way. And, and yeah. you were having a hard time saying anything. Yes, I yes. said, "Oh, what is it? What is yeah. it? What is it?" And and then you you shared uh, the story. But as I as I thought about that, hope not only did he orchestrate missing the turn. Right. 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 Not only did he orchestrate you offering to pray for right, him, right, okay? Right. He orchestrated all that stuff. But you know what? He used us to give a word of encouragement right. to John. Right, exactly. Two guys that missed a turn, right. stumbled into his office, right. convinced him to go have lunch with us, and then look at look what happened as a result of that lunch. I'm yeah. so grateful, Thank so you. grateful that God thought enough of us right. to use us in that way. I was as humble at that moment as I ever can ever remember being in my life. No and doubt. I may never be as humble as that ever again. No doubt. But that, if you're not humble in a situation like that, because you have been in the presence of God Almighty. Absolutely. And been a part of His plan that you saw happen and unfold. Exactly. In a man's life. Was saved. Was saved and spared. Praise the Lord. So it is. It's just a wonderful, wonderful story uh, for for both of us. Sure. You know, for both. Well, Hope, so. thanks for sharing that story. It brings back a lot of memories uh, to me too. And I know I don't need to ask you this, but I do it after every interview. Mm-hmm. Would you say that the way God worked all this out was a God thing? Absolutely, a God thing. No question about it. If you don't believe it? Ask him. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Hope. Appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you, Chuck. Wow, what a great half hour this has been. Tune in next time for more great God Thing stories and tell all your friends to tune in too. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you or someone you know has a verifiable story which needs to be told, please email a brief summary to us at mystory at itsagodthingradio.com. That's my story, all one word, at itsagodthingradio.com. See you next time. Amen.